I was in Chicago last week and I got extraordinarily convicted about a subject matter that I absolutely know one of my mandates in New York is to pioneer here um, and don't feel disrespected by this, but I, I feel like something that I'm supposed to do in New York is recreate and recraft people's ideas of praise and worship. I don't think we know what it really does. And I don't really think we know what it really means. Don't get offended yet. I think there is a, a, a cultural mentality that thinks that praise and worship is for the esteem of God. Like, like when I shout and clap and dance, it makes him feel better about himself. But we've not seen and, 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 and studied it enough to know what it does for my life. I die if I don't praise. And, and I'm weak when I can't worship. And it impacts me psychologically and physiologically and physically. So, so even down, watch me, to the commands of the Psalms, I think people have reduced it, Charles, to church theatrics. Clap your hands because it's quiet in the room. Or bow because... The altar is in whatever the thing is. But the physical commands in the Psalms have nothing to do with God liking yoga. And it has everything to do with you teaching your body to do what your heart should have been doing the whole time. The, the problem is, is that the human nature is, 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 is visual. And so God gives us instructions like clap your hands or lift your hands. Eventually, I don't know how long I'm going to be in here but for, for, the, for the series, but eventually I'm going to teach you about the toda, the halal, the tahila, the yada, and, and all of that stuff that, that makes sense. So, so, for example, indulge me, the word halal, we say hallelujah, but the word halal means to act a fool. It literally means to act foolish. Now, listen, if you don't learn how to act a fool, there's going to be certain directives God gives you that you don't do because you don't like how you look. So when I say hallelujah, it, it actually does. Sorry, Ajani. It, it actually means something different. I'm teaching myself that I can look a fool for him. And, and, and there's nothing. I'm, I'm not upholding, watch me, my image for the sake of what people think and say. Say, I hear you. All right, take out your notes. I'm about to teach you something about praise and worship that is absolutely essential because what the Spirit of Grace said to me, if I be God's man and if I have air in my lungs, is that God is dealing with a praise and worship revolution. There is something in our identities that are lacking as a byproduct of this last season. And I think the only thing that's going to put it back together is praise and worship. And I'm not talking about Sunday morning. And to your dis disappointment, I'm not even talking about singing because that's the other issue. Because when I teach you about praise and worship, everybody thinks fast and slow music. But praise and worship has nothing to do with the A and the B selection. It has everything to do with what I can do with my heart. Even when I don't want to do it. So we're going to read some scriptures. I'm going to give you some principles, and then we're going to activate what we learn. Are y'all with me? We still friends? Okay. I want you to go very first to a very unusual scripture. It's Jonah chapter 2. <laughs> Jonah. Now, you know, I, I actually have an unpublished book about Jonah called no and uh, I'm trying but uh, I was under contract before the pandemic and I wrote a book called no and it's about those that rebel to God's call and um, and and what to do so I got it on here I, I might just lose it but anyway my point is people don't preach from the book of Jonah because they see themselves and in Jonah chapter 2 I'm coming in Jonah chapter 2 verse 8 go there hurry up Write notes. Jonah chapter 2 verse 8. Here is what it says. I'll give you my title midway. Jonah 2 8. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. So principle number one. You can't have idolatry in your life and conceptualize God's love. One will stand in the way of the other. 
Let's go to the next scripture. Psalms 16 and 4. Psalm 16 and 4. Thank you, baby mama. I need your strength this morning. Psalm 16 and 4. Are you there? No. Come on, you're going to have to be a teaching church. Psalm 16 and 4. Those who run after other gods, which, which implies to me, if I'm thinking about this intelligently, one of the things other gods want you to do is chase them. <laughs> they, they put pursuit in you. You, you find a way to have a seek that you probably wouldn't have otherwise. Those who run after other gods, watch this, will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. Galatians chapter 4 and 8. We're almost there. Galatians. Galatians 4 and 8. She, when I hit the lottery, she one of the first people getting the houses. Why are you laughing? <laughs> Galatians 4 and 8. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. Now my favorite book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 9. <laughs> Let's go to Revelation 9. Now, let me give you a brief seminary lesson. Can you handle this or not? Revelation has no S on the end of it. Because it's not trying to prove multiple points. The point of the book of Revelation is Jesus Christ. <laughs> there, there's not multiple points. But here's the problem. Um, I'm trying to see how much I want to say. Revelation is older than Genesis. Who Jesus was seen in the book of Revelation predates who he was seen by the time y'all got Genesis. Our problem is we think Genesis is the beginning of God's story because it's the beginning of the Bible. <laughs> but the beginning of the Bible is not the beginning of God's story. We just preach it wrong. Jesus was being Jesus way before Adam was being Adam. And we just read it a little. A little backwards. Preach it later, evangelist. He's always been there. And 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 and, and we can prove it. Revel hey, Revelation 9 and 20. That's why when mm, never mind. Revelation 9 and 20. People say they're waiting on the second coming. And I often ask them, where did he go? <laughs> he promised he'd never leave and nor forsake. Revelation 9.20, I'll let y'all deal with that. Revelation 9.20, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. Pay attention to this. They did not stop worshiping demons. This is fascinating to me. And idols of gold silver, bronze, stone, and wood. Let's do some work, Ajani. Idols that cannot see. I'm about to, um, yeah, I almost lost it there. And they cannot hear. And they can't even walk. And have the audacity to want to be worshipped. And can't see. And can't hear. And can't walk. I'm talking to you today about dumb idols. And, and I, because here's why. Let's, let's lay this foundation like a class, okay? Let's participate. You cannot have a real conversation about praise and worship by starting with musicality. 
You, can, you, you got to start the whole subject of praise and worship with talking about idolatry. And I don't know that America has really laid an effective foundation in Christianity about what idolatry is and what idolatry does. Because when I say idols, you think the little dumb Buddha statues in the nail shops. That's what you think. You think that the mangoes on there and the little, you know, all that. But there's so much deeper systemic thinking to idolatry that might be holding you back and you may not realize that you can be an idolatrous Christian. There may be something that has more of your attention than God and there may be something that has more of your energy than God and if you don't understand the Decalogue, watch me, which is what we call the Ten Commandments, why in the world? Now I'm going to teach you something deeper. You got to take notes. The principle of firstness is also worship. In the Bible, there are certain things that are said at first and you have to pay attention to what the Holy Ghost said first. You got to understand that the way the scriptures are written is that when God says something first or when God says something last, there needs to be emphasis puts on both places. It's almost as if if God says something first, because I still believe he altered the Bible, but anyway, if God says something first, it's like him addressing an audience. I want you to get this. I want you to know this. And then when he says something last, it's like his last will and testament. It's like this is the most important important thing I want you to know before this chapter is closed. So in the principle of firstness, open your mouth and say first. first. He says something real interesting in the Decalogue. Now whether they're going to admit it or not, but Germany, Russia, Israel, China, uh, Egypt, the entire of human civility and society is set up on what God told Moses. They going to lie about it. But why do you think we have laws to begin with? Every, why do you think you go to jail for murder? And why do you think you go to jail for theft? And why do you think you go to jail for any of the things that's listed in what we know to be the Ten Commandments? I think your problem is you watched the movie and didn't study the ministry of it. And so you saw Moses come down with that white hair and you took nothing away from how God was trying to shape a people through the Ten Commandments. And when you study the Ten Commandments, the first thing that came out of the mouth of the righteous God was you will have I can't tell you how to treat your wife before I tell you that you won't have another God before me. I can't teach you how to interface with your neighbor before I tell you you can't have another God before me. I can't teach you what to do with your business and your fields and all of that before I teach you that you can't have no other gods before me. So he says, first of all, you can have no other gods before me. So the issue of idolatry is the primary theme of Israel's rebellion. I'll teach you about it later. But God judged Old Covenant Israel because of their consistent, their consistent whoring with other gods. Yeah. They, they, they were just consistently disobeying their instruction and disobeying their statutes and disobeying their laws because they wanted something they could see. Remember how we got David to begin with and Saul to begin with? Because Israel wanted to be like everybody else. Which leads me to believe that comparison might lead you to idolatry. Because... Israel said, we want a king. Give us one. And God said, all right, go ahead. You want flesh like you? I'm going to give you flesh like you. And, 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 and he going to be just as clay and just as human and just as fractured as you are. The only difference between him and you is he going to have a crown. I'm going to give him to you. And he gave him to him. And when he got them, we ended up seeing how that went. Where that went, the, the discontinuation of what should have been Saul's reign because of idolatry. Think about Josiah and the prophet is holder. I know I'm boring you. And, and, and how God told Josiah as an eight-year-old boy who was, who was reigning, he told him, I want you to go and tear their altars down. I want you to bring their poles down. Don't you have nothing around here that's acting like it can be me. And acting like it can have my attention. It was idolatry. Which Glenn leads me to know that one of the assignments of every king is to confront idols. Yes. 
<laughs> in the same way that a king has the way to initiate and enthrone them, a king has the power to confront an idol. How many kings do we know that created the idols? Or how many kings became them? I'm going to keep going. And so, so this is a root call. Now, one of the things you need to know about your human self, are you, are you with me, um, is that you can't help but worship. It, it, it is native to you. It's how God created Adam. You are, God took walks <laughs> with Adam. It's, it's, it's in you innately to worship. You're going to worship something. The challenge is, what is it going to be? And salvation determines what you're going to worship. I love your powerful word. And when people are in sin, what it really is, is redirected or misdirected worship. And because it's something that we don't talk often about, we really do think that worship is this. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Put on the strings now. Hallelujah. And we do that and we go home disobedient, defiant, can't stand to be corrected, unwilling to change, don't want to adjust. You can't tell me you're a worshiper with that. You're just a good singer. Lift your hands and say there is a difference because real worshipers want to change. So we have this sub the, the capacity to let's talk about lust. Um, don't get uncomfortable, guys, please. I'm trying to teach. I'm a, let me find a reason to holler. I'm going to say he got up at the end. <laughs> Sex addiction is, is about a pleasure principle, which most people rely on when they don't know what to do with personal pain. So, so what happens is if I have an undealt with, I know you don't like this, but I can't turn my plow. When you have personal pain, you're going to medicate it somehow. For some, it's alcohol. For some, it's marijuana. For some, it's crack. For some, it's porn. For some, it's chocolate, believe it or not. But everybody has a thing that they want to medicate what they don't understand and what they can't feel. So then it leads me to believe that lust is misdirected worship. What you're communicating when you can't go without it is, I need you to think, and I need you to sleep, and I need you to breathe. I can't go through stress without you. I can't go through pressure without it. I've just simply got to have it. You're not a freak. You're a worshiper. I'm trying not to holler. I'm... I'm, I'm but Orgies ain't new. That stuff ain't got nothing to do with twin. Folks were having sex parties in Old Testament Israel. They were having sex parties in temples in Israel. Why? Worship. It was a form of expressing their commitment to Baal and their commitment to Ashtoreth. They were cross-dressing then. This stuff is not new. The prophets that Elijah slayed were dressed like the other gender. It's not new. As a matter of fact, it's very old. Talking about idolatry. Be seated, guys. I don't... Idols. Now, because the human, the, one of the highest potentials of any human being, there are two. There are two. The, 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 the highest potential of any human being is holiness. You, you, there is nothing more you can become other than holy. And you become that by faith. Say yes. But then the second thing you become is a worshiper. And the odd thing is you can't be one without being the other. Because when you worship and you do it well, it's going to keep you holy. And, 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 when, and when you are holy, you can't help but worship. <laughs> because it's atmospheric. It is environmental. Say yes. 
quick lesson. I'm going to deviate and get back to it. Number one, praise is environmental. Praise is atmospheric. We can do things right now in praise that will change how this room feels. It has absolutely nothing to do with what you want. There's a lot of people that's going to praise God and go home and do what they want to do. They're going to dance. They're they, they going they well, and, and they're not going to change anything about their life diet. They, they're going to die like that. You're not a worshiper until what you want is different. And, and when you're dealing with idolatry, you can praise easily. I know you don't like this. I'm not simplifying praise. I'm saying that you ain't even got to be saved to do it. Ask me how. If these should hold their peace, rocks will cry out. Rocks ain't got no soul. But God created planets, rocks, grass, trees, and they will all praise him. So praise don't really distinguish you. It has a function. It goes first. Whenever something new is happening and whenever something new is about to occur, Judah's got to go first, and that's a biblical praise. But when you get into worship, it's not just atmospheric. It's not just external. Worship is internal. Because you, you, you can be a praiser and not let God deal with you. But you cannot be a worshiper and not experience the dealings of God. He's going he's gonna to say, hey, I know what they did, and I know what they said, and I know how that felt, but here is where I am with you. Your standard ain't theirs. Your character can't be theirs. Your calling can't be theirs. I want this out of you. You are yoked to me. You are a bondservant to me. I need you to conform to me. Worship equals conformity. So anybody not changing ain't really worshiping. Worshipping. Dumb idols. Um, idols are icons of several things. Can you handle more? All right. Um, idols are icons of several things. Number one, an idol is a picture of desire. Desire. Idols are directly connected to desire. I desire something. Now, I know that this is boring you, but I want you to consider how much of your life is connected to what you desire. How many decisions have you made because of a desire? I have a desire for this. It could be dumb but it's here. It could be unwise, but it's here. It could even be dangerous, but it's here. I have a desire. And so idols are physical pictures and physical reenactments of things that we desire. Number two, idols are also icons of needs because there is a difference between a desire and a need. Your word is life. Um, a desire can be something that's fleeting or fading in a matter of your maturity, but Everybody got real needs. Talk back to me. And, and, and we don't like to talk about what we need because we've been so disappointed and so let down and so hurt that those needs are, um, they're dangerous to communicate. And so, but the, but the heart has seven longings that I teach about. And those needs are in every human being. And one of them is protection, security, wanting to be wanted, provided for. All of those are needs that if you don't get those needs met you are not yourself you, you you won't grow you'll stagnate at the last stage and age of your pain some of you are 40 but you're really 19 and what it is is an unmet need Woo! you can't worship without exposing your need you, you, you can't really be a worshiper without admitting and confessing the point and the place of need. And the church don't even have a healthy doctrine on why we need to need. That's why we lie in testimony service. So, um, needs. The other thing that an idol is, is I hope this is okay. Uh, the other thing that an idol is, is uh, our idea of an outcome. Because in the Old Testament, when people would go to idols and they would make offerings, I'm coming in a minute, they would bring something to an idol because every idol wants something out of you. 
So they would bring offerings and all of that. For example, there was, there was one particular idol that required the, the blood of the unborn, abortion. His name was Molech. And the Bible said that the way that they would worship Molech was that they would bring unborn children to him and that they would sacrifice fresh blood. Hmm. Why? Because Molech knew that without the shedding of blood, <laughs> he knows that blood is the communication of life and life exchange. So in order to be the one that claims the right to life, I want the unborn. Give me fresh blood. Give me new blood. Every church predator and molester is serving the God of Molech. And Lord, I'm out here. Snatching and raping and taking your virginity. It's a manifestation of something that requires fresh blood. So needs, desires, and outcomes. Now, all right, let's take a deep breath. I feel like I'm overwhelming you. Okay, when you, when you, <laughs> when you think about your life, let's, let's, let's all take a mental and emotional journey to what you want out of a future. That's outcome. Why do you think the word ideal sounds like the word idol? Because you may have a plan, a calendar, a schedule, a rhythm, a timing, a people, a place, a purpose, a definition, an identity that is your ideal outcome. But what if I submitted to you that it might be idolatrous? And, and what if it's possible that you're praising and worshiping and sowing for something God never wanted for you? For all two of you that clap, may the Lord bless you real good. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to express to you that there are more things in our lives that are idolatrous than what we know. And, and we've got to identify that if we're going to grow, all right? Now, uh, I'm going to get that back there. Um, I cast out devils. <laughs> I know y'all don't think that, but, you know, I just don't talk about, oh, yeah. I, um, I cast the devil out, and uh, I, I, I love God so much that I hate hell. And one of the things that I try to impart in everybody that's attached to me is a hatred for hell. I hate hell. I, I, I can't stand what Satan does to lives. Damon, when I'm walking up the street and I see people strung out on crack, I, 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 my tear ducts are, I, I have to, I, I have a gift of compassion. So I find myself being uncomfortable and disturbed and wanting to move. I hate hell. And because I hate hell, congratulations, I have a spiritual warfare ministry. And Providence would have it that I would get introduced, God, God I love you, to a man of God who would further impart a history of hell hatred in me. <laughs> he would grab my head and impart this thing in me. You will bind and loose and curse, and what you say will matter. And it started happening. I have laid hands on people, and all kinds of devils have come out, but I've not even made that idolatrous because I don't hate hell more than I love Jesus. Yeah. So I'm not eager to find my way at an altar to try to prove that I'm powerful. I'm not eager to make sure I show people that I can cast the devil out and I got authority. It's not about proving me. This is not the Apollo. I love Jesus. And because I love Jesus, I hate hell. Lift your hands and say, get it together. One's got to come over the other. I understand you want folk to throw up and vomit and roll on the floor and all that. I get it. But if you ain't a worshiper, all of that is for naught to begin with. The most powerful warriors are worshipers. They fight better <laughs> because they're fighting for a reason that's above and beyond themselves. Now, I um, have been studying. Um, I, I got a little Greek in me, got a little Hebrew in me. You know, I'm not bragging, risk, but it's a, it's a couple of things in me that I kind of got under my belt. You understand? But... Um, when trying to explain demons and trying to explain demonization, 
I have often struggled. Here is the difference with me. I hope I'm not boring you. Um, the difference with me is that I avoid theological emphatics. So what I do is, if I don't know, I say I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to look at a scripture and say, this is what it means by faith. I, I'll look at it and say, I don't understand what this means, and, and, and let it go. People have often asked, where, where, who, what are demons, and where do they come from, and how do they exist, and how many are there? And there are several questions that I, I, I just don't have that, but I understand what the Bible says about them. And the most important thing that I need to know about them is that they exist. Right. And I know they exist because Jesus dealt with them. <laughs> so I, I don't care if they came from, from the underworld or, or, the, or, or Saturn. I don't give a nickel's worth of dog meat where their origin is. I know they exist because Jesus spent an ample amount of his ministry preaching and casting out devils. I love that. Preaching and casting out devils. Preaching and casting out devils. Preaching and casting out devils. Another characteristic, though, this is important to this subject of, of idolatry. What we do know about demons is that they are fallen. And, 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 and Christians don't know enough about the fallen characteristics. What it means to be something. Jesus said about Lucifer, I saw him fall. And, and, and if he fell... Everything that follows him has to fall. So you can't be idolatrous and not be falling. Eventually, you're going to fall from a high place, from a lofty place. If you're following something that ain't him, he's fallen. That means he's low down. That, that means he's ignorant. That means he's handicapped. That means he's weak. Now, I'm going to tell you one of the things uh, that I don't like about the religious spirit, Prophet Jasmine, is that it almost platforms Lucifer like he has equal strength to God. Let me set the record straight. He is not omniscient. He is not omnipresent. You can find him exactly where he is. You can't act like he's the, the, going around doing whatever he wants to do. The Bible say even the demons still tremble now. Why do you think we have the name of Jesus? Because everything has to tremble. And so he's a fallen thing. Idols are fallen. Now, let's give you some practical things and I'm going to let you go. I feel like you're mad. If something is idolatrous, they can't see. Let's think about this. Let's act like we're the, they can't. And I would never worship and, and commit my life to something they could not see. Because of my own blindness and my own lack of perspective, I have not been to the future. I, I barely understand the past, and sometimes I'm pissed at the present. So if I'm going to commit myself to a God, he's got to be able to see. So I'm not going to avow my life to something that don't have 20-20 vision. You're going to have to see me. One of the favorite things I see in the Psalms is David said, you see my risings and you see my down going. Will you just lift your hands and say, he sees me. He... Now, think about what happens to a life that does not feel seen. I have never seen a life that didn't feel seen that didn't eventually disappear. They, they, they always go into something dark when they don't feel seen. But the Lord sees you. He, he, he sees you. And, and I must say something that a lot of bishops and pastors and apostles and prophets and arch apostles and, and, and bi bishop deluxes are going to be mad at. But, but, but I'm going to tell you something, and I want you to shout one time. God ain't even mad at your secrets. I'm going to tell you that right now. He is not mad about what people don't know that's going on in you. You know why? Because he knew it. He, he saw it already. He accepts you where you at. 
You have shame unnecessarily. You can't disappoint a God who knows everything. You think you surprised him with your flaw and surprised him with your weakness? No, from before your mother's womb. Anyway, so an idol cannot see. Why would you want to serve something that does not see? What if, what if people don't know what to do with their future because they're serving something blind? What if people don't know what their next decision is is because what they want most is blind? I want to serve El Roe. Now that's, that means the all-seeing God. I want somebody who can look at me and see the future, the past, and the present all at the same time. And then got the nerve whoa, out of his love for me to give him insomnia. He does not sleep or slumber because he's staring at me. I want the seeing God on my side. My God has no blind spots. My God can't be caught off guard. My God can't see something not coming. He knew the whole thing already. Lift your hands and say, he sees me. You still don't believe me. Where can I go from your presence? If I take on the wings of the morning and if I go to the uttermost places of the earth and if I make my bed in hell, you're still there. Wherever I do in my life, where can I hide from you? I can't because the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the Lift your hands and say, he sees me. And an idol cannot see. Number two, an idol cannot hear. Let's talk about this. I'm, how much time? Let's, let's, let's talk about a, 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 a God that needs a hearing aid. Let's talk about a God that you can't pray to with guarantee. Fee, this is what he told me. When you call me, I will answer you. And, and, and then he said that this is the confidence. The only thing you need to be confident in life is not them or him or her. This is the confidence that I have that when I pray, God, I love you. He heareth me. Now, I would never serve a God that did not listen. And I, I can barely stand people that don't listen. So what? Why would I give my life to a God that didn't lend his ear to my petition and my supplication? Uh, glory. I'm trying not to get lost in it, but he, he's a hearing God. Not, not only, not only. Y'all going to have, he, 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 not only does he see, but he hears. And he's so beautiful that he not only hears words, he hears feelings. He hears tears. Tears are statements in heaven. He, he hears experiences. He hears burdens. He's a hearing God. What do you think he's up there doing? You think he's making chitterlings and greens? Oh, no, he's listening. Hey, he's hearing glory. Every time you dance and every time you run and every time you cry and every time you say, Jesus, whosoever will call. I don't know if y'all remember that that's an audible thing. You can't be quiet and call him. So whosoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be. Why? Because he heard you. The righteous crieth out, and the Lord delivered them. Many, listen, I'm talking to worshipers, and I'm talking about idolatry. Many, 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 I don't like this, but many, Shantay, are all the afflictions of the righteous. But, I want you to just say but, come on, just... The Lord delivereth. Woo! Hey, glory. You read this to me, He, he. But the Lord delivereth them. He delivereth from them all, because the righteous cries, and the Lord delivereth them, because He hears. Now, when you're dealing with idolatry, you're dealing with something that is going to inevitably ignore you. 
You want something from it. You need something from it. You desire something from it. And it's not changing. Nothing it's doing to be attentive to you. And yet you give it your seek. And you give it your offering. And you give it your time and your investment. And it still ain't listening to you. Here's the next one. God help me. Pastor Darrell, you might have given me too much time. And I know my church well. Somebody's trying not to flip off this balcony about now. <laughs> they can't see. They can't hear. And Jermaine, they can't even speak. Imagine being in a relationship and being in a marriage where somebody refuses to talk. Let's, let's simplify this. We got to take this out of Disney. In idolatry, you, 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 you are consistently committed to something that won't have a conversation with you. And, and, and something that refuses to, to tell you what stuff is and where stuff is going and, and, and give you an honesty. This is, makes sense because it's like Jesus said, and you will know the truth. What he was basically saying was, no matter what's going on, I'm going to talk to you. And, and, and then he said, would I tell you in secret? Which means that there is a such thing as intimate conversation. He says, would I tell you in secret? Share it on the mountain. I want you to go and I want you to share that. So we serve, as it were, a talking God. And I know that people don't believe that because they tell y'all stupid stuff like, God ain't talking all day. Are you dumb? <laughs> What, what the heck do you mean? <laughs> the man ho sent his son and nicknamed him the word. What you mean he ain't talking? He's always talking. I can listen right now and he'll tell me something about you. Just because you ain't hearing him don't mean he ain't talking. He just ain't talking to you. Had to get that out my system. Sorry. He's always talking. Now, he may not be talking as frequently as people imply. And I do agree that people blame stuff on God that may be hallucinations or may be a figure of their imaginations. And one day, maybe when I'm dead and gone, people will stop confusing the prophetic anointing with mental illness because I, I do, I, 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 I believe, I believe that people think that every monkey they see or, or every gas pain they have is God telling them something and some of it is just outright delusional. I don't think a lot of people have discernment. I think they're delusional. It's, it, it, you, you don't know enough Bible to be discerning. So because of if the Bible according to Hebrews 4 is the discerner, then you're not going to tell me you got discernment and you don't have a study life. I don't believe it. Something else may be talking to you. There are 34, 34 voices. You can hear a lot of stuff. Fears, ancestors, paranoias. All of that ain't God trying to warn you. Some of it is your trauma trying to train you. And you want to project that on other people. But we're not ready for that conversation. So, um, it's fall. I'm almost done. Um, Here's, here are things that idols want. I promise you I'm almost done. You can eat all the chicken you want. Somebody did that. I did that. An idol, number one, most importantly, wants your worship. They, they, it wants to be esteemed. My theory is this, and people are going to disagree with me again and bash me and put me on the church shade room and all that st stupid stuff. My theory is that every idol, so there was, one th there was one third of the angels that followed Lucifer in rebellion. My theory, Ja, is that when he got to the earth, all of them started religions. Here is why. They knew that the easiest way to conform the human race was worship. So let's become Islam. And let's become Buddhism. What do you think those things are? I think those are the things that follow Lucifer out of heaven. And when they got to earth, they, they took on an image. They took on an icon. They became something that people could make offerings to because they wanted to change the human race. Ask me why. The ultimate goal of your life is to be conformed in the image and likeness of God.
And if so God wants you to be conformed, what do you think Lucifer wants? Conformity. You get that through worship. So you can start, and, and here's what's crazy. When you go through a, 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 a reasonable uh, seminary, because my theory is a lot of them today are cemeteries. <laughs> I know a lot of people that went to seminary saved and, and left seminary agnostic. They got convinced out of the Holy Ghost. We're not ready for that either. So, um, so, so, so my theory is, where did the fallen angels go? I think they went in their own colonization of religions. And so they became things that we think are just differences of views and differences of expression and opinion. But I can't unsee and I can't unhear the fact that Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. That suggests that something else out there is a lie. And that suggests that something else out there is a deception. Now, when you're dealing with the subject of idol idolatry, I'm giving you the list of the things that all idols want. You can't have a, a talk about idolatry and not talk about deception. There's nobody that's in idolatry that's not deceived. And you know what's funny about people in deception? They don't know they're in deception. <laughs> I've never met a deceived person that knew they were deceived. There's about a hundred of you in this room right now that's deceived. Just deceived. You, you, you just believe what you want and, and you just attach to what you want. But listen, deception is an extension of devotion. When you are committed to your own view and your own perspective and your own opinion, my Bible told me that rebellion was like witchcraft and stubbornness. You, yeah, y'all don't want to hear me is idolatry so you cannot because my th Buddha is okay Allah, Hiku uh, whoever else is out there Mahatma Gandhi we can find all of them but, he, but, but here's the, here's, here, here, here is the problem ain't none of them more dangerous than this idol I have found out I will put my last dime on it the most dangerous idol in the world is you You don't want to hear it. Self-worship is more dangerous than Satan worship. When, when you work, why do you think Satan became Satan? Worship of self. So self-worship, self-preservation, self, all of that stuff, lack of surrender, lack of submission. I'm coming. Lack of you, all of that stuff, that, 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 that forceful headedness about you and what you do and want in life is a manifestation of idolatry and it could be why you cannot prosper right now because God don't prosper people that don't want to give him the praise he wants your worship the next thing is he wants your work all idols want employees they, they want to make you servants and or slaves of them are you learning something they want your worship and they want your work. If you study Ashtoreth, Baal, if you study any of the Old Testament idols, there's, there's one of them called Lilith. It means screeching owl. I think that it's the demon responsible for nightmares. It's not God's will for you to be tortured in your sleep. Where do you think that stuff comes from? It's a devil. And I know y'all don't like saying that. <laughs> But some of that stuff is, is demonic. You, you, you should be able. The Bible says he gives his beloved sleep, which means that sleep should be a gift to you. And if a gift is tainted by torment and terror and restlessness, you are under attack by a demonic spirit. Okay. Where do you think nightmare? For, where do you think dreams come from? D dreams are one of the ways I'll never leave God is because you can't convince me God ain't real because I've dreamed things before it happened and I know my mind is not intelligent enough to forecast 
So I've seen eternity in my head because he promised me that he would grant me dreams and visions. It's a byproduct of the Holy Ghost. And I know how y'all Pentecostals are. Y'all think the only fruit of the Holy Ghost is tongues. But my Bible tells me they will speak in tongues and prophesy. And your young men will see visions. The dream realm is one of the manifestations of being full of the Holy Ghost. Anyway, they want your work, your work ethic, your work commitment. You can look at what you worship by trying to determine what you're willing to work for. So your work. It's getting quiet. Okay. Here's another thing that, that idols want. Your will. Um, like your diet, your sexual behavior, your, 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 your career choices, your, oh, here's a word that I know y'all don't want to hear, your indecision, your undecisiveness, your inability to, to your procrastinations even. What if it's a matter of a will unsurrendered? What if you've not given up the will and, 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 and let that thing go? Now, here is a dangerous one, and I'm going to have to find a way to encourage you after this. Um, there was never an idol in the Bible that didn't want your wealth. Them things have the nerve to want you to serve them and then tax you. <laughs> You're going to pay me to praise me. You, you, you got to come to this God and bring offerings. When Elijah prophetically allowed the heavens to be closed, they were coming and they were bringing blood offerings and sacrifices and w fruit offerings and grain offerings because offerings is an extension or an expression of worship. And so these things want your wealth. I believe that the power of, of poverty, I don't want to be deep. Mammon is the thing responsible for poverty. It's called mammon. And, and Jesus taught about mammon, and a part of what he said was, you cannot have two gods, which was a warning that there are people that really do believe that they are worshiping the Lord, and they're really worshiping what they want from him. Several years ago, the Lord told me, Kenny, he said, I was, I'll never forget, I was in a service, and um, I was having an attack, and praising, and ah, ah, you know, because I was, I was, this is why y'all always hear me talk about Kenny, because I was just like him. I would run and fall out and praise, and you wasn't going to stop me. I'd swing on you if you tried to pull me down. I had to do it to survive, so I understand him. So I was in a service, and I was going through that, and, and the Holy Ghost said to me, he said, um, I'm about to bless the kingdom. This was his tone. I'm about to bless the kingdom, and I said, hey, whoo, whoo, whoo. I went harder. And then he said, because I want to smoke it out. And my smile changed. My dance kind of slowed down. I was like. I sat down. And I remember at the altar of my grandfather's church, he said to me, I'm about to prove that people never wanted me. But I'm going to give them what they want to show them that they wanted stuff out of me. And they never wanted me. They wanted my hand and not my face. They wanted my hand and not my heart. The hand of God is provision. The feet of God is service. The face of God is transformation. And what he said to me is people want what I can give to them. This is why all of testimony service is about provision. People don't testify about God checking them in rebellion and God changing their dysfunction or breaking them out of dysfunctional curses. They always like, I was down to my last dime. Why? Because I wouldn't serve a God that let me get that low. Wants your wealth. The final thing that I believe and submit that every idol wants, the first one was your worship. The second one was your work. The third one was your will. The fourth one was your wealth. The last one is your ways. I think that every idol wants to impact and shape your personality type. How you are. 
as a person. Because if conformity is the goal of praise and worship, you have to adjust how and who you are to accommodate the desire or the demands of that demon or that lowercase g-o-d god um and so every think about there let, let's talk about a real soul tie have you ever seen something happen to me today i'm gonna have to talk to somebody about it but there are different types of soul ties okay all of them are not necessarily demonic god god cannot you to um certain people, certain dynamics, certain relationships in ways that makes life flow. If a soul tie restricts life, it's demonic. If a soul tie causes life, it's from God. David and Jonathan had one. John the Beloved and Jesus had uh, heart knots. There were moments there. But one of the things I notice about demonic soul ties is when you start to sleep with people, and or you have I don't have the time to go here, Sister Desi, but you have spirit spouses where you fall in <laughs> where you fall in love with people who don't even know you. They ain't coming to church next week. They gonna stay, they gonna stay home. And it, it, it's 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 a realm of fantasy. And, and, and the fantasy realm is a perverse realm of your creativity. So when people have fantasy, Lord help me, when people have fantasies, their creativity is fogged up because they're desiring things that they may never ever get or never ever have within their means. Anyway, I have seen people in soul ties, common law marriages or uh, uh, weird, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, abnormal uh, relationships when they take on each other's personality types. Where like I've seen kind people turn rageful. I've, I've seen patient people take on, you will start adapting your, your I have even seen, you know, we uh, black people are superstitious, but I have seen when people were married for years when they started resembling features where like spouses started to kind of like favor or smile alike or something like that. It's the manifestation of a soul tie. Why? A soul tie is a vow. Whether it's by your permission or not, it is an allowance of your heart and or your soul to be knotted to a thing that's outside of your bonding. So when you think about the dangers of that, you really do have to be careful about who you befriend. And you really do have to be careful about who mentors you. And you really do have to be careful about who is your overseer. Because some of your overseers only see at your level. <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. So um, <laughs> you got to be careful. Now, the other thing about soul ties before I pray is that you can, you can have them with people, but you can have them with places. You can have them with ideas. You can have them with cities. You, some of, I, I mean, I'll never forget, man, in the uh, early 2000s, every African American in America thought that they was only gonna succeed if they rushed to Georgia. And now, <laughs> I hate going there because the, the traffic is so bad. I'm like, well, some of y'all moved to Texas or something because Atlanta is not heaven. What are you doing? Forgive me for the expression. <laughs> but you can have a soul tie with a city. God told, do you know how many times God told Abraham to move? And do you know how long it took him to actually do it? Soul ties with actual places, like geographical places. You don't want to hear this. Um, I don't have the time, <laughs> Jermaine. Um, <laughs> There is something in, in psycho oh, I don't want to say this. There is something in psychological communities and counseling communities called an Oedipus complex. Where sons and daughters can be in love with their parents. I know you might not have heard, I, I, I know you've not heard the phrase, but I know that was because I've been in deliverance and healing and all. I have seen people that desperately do everything to earn the affection, the attention, the support of, the praise of, the words of, the affirmations of their parents. And here's where it gets weird, whether they're dead or alive. 
So then now we're into necromancy because I want the words of a dead person. I want the validation of a dead person. And then I'm so delusional that when I go to bed and dream and my dead parent comes to me and tells me something, I'm encouraged. And I should be horrified. Because if you're in heaven, you should be worshiping. And if you're in hell, you should be being tormented. Why are you talking to me? Or you want me to turn my plow? I can't do it. Don't you follow your grandmama into no light. If she come to you talking about walk with me, baby, you wake up immediately and say, devil, I bind you. You spirit, you angel of light. I curse you. Go back to hell. Don't you come to me trying to invite me nowhere. <laughs> I know y'all don't like that. Mm -mm. Because, it, you know, when I go to heaven, I'm not coming back to visit nobody. Good luck. Enjoy your stay. I'm before the beautiful one. I'm at the throne of God. I ain't coming back to give you no warnings. Auntie Betty came to me and showed me fishes. Who's pregnant? Nobody. Not man, another. No, it's witchcraft. I know y'all don't like that. It's sorcery. It's necromancy. And you need deliverance. I'm going to tell you why. That stuff will drive you crazy. If you think that relatives are coming up from the grave to, to talk to you, what it really is is a spirit guide. And you make whole decisions off of stuff that the dead people have to say to you. No. Now, why do you think that's so easy? Grief. The enemy knows the power of grief. So grief becomes like an open door for him to give you imaginations of people you loved to torment you. So idols. We, we've, got to, we've got to figure this out. I wonder, respectfully, what you're worshiping. I wonder whose attention you want. I wonder what um, arrival place you desire and what you're willing to do to get to it. America, now I have been to literally over 50 nations and I ain't done. Apparently I'm supposed to go to more. But, but I've, been, I've been to Mozambique, Botswana, Lagos. I've been to a lot of people. And, and, and when I would go initially, the saints would be warning me, cover yourself in the blood. I'm like, let me tell you something. <laughs> I have felt more demonic oppression in America than I have in some of foreign countries around the world. And here is why. America don't realize her idolatry. There is a, there is a pride that God's been trying to break in America for generations. And they just will not lament. And so because his mercy doth endure forever, God has been long-suffering with us and he's been patient with us. But there is an arrogance. There, there is a conceit. There is an ego. America learned during this pandemic that she could be touched. I don't trust prophets, as you need, that like judgment. That's why. I don't trust prophets that get excited about judgment. I think real prophetic gifts should weep before they warn. Don't prophesy to me if you can't cry for me. <laughs> and there are some warnings that the nation needs. And one of them is the reason behind these consistent plagues is because intercessors are AWOL. Everybody want to preach. 
and nobody wants to pray. The, the, the psalmists have even forgot that their first role is intercession. You can't make up the gap of my relationship with God and interpret my distance from God through praise and worship if you're not an intercessor. I think that we've got to, something has to happen with the power of intercession um, because that's the reason why plagues come. They come because gaps, openings. They're, they're foxes and, and, and traps. So I intend for the next several weeks, however long it takes, to teach you about praise and worship. And, and then maybe I'll teach you about music, but that ain't what I'm talking about. I'm talking about worship as a way of life. How quick do you obey? That's worship. How do you cultivate your gratitude? That's praise. So it has nothing to do with the 30-minute selection up here and everything to do with how quick it takes you to change your heart on a matter and to change your mind on a matter. I have, I have apologized when I didn't do nothing wrong only because I'm a worshiper. I have received apologies that I've never heard only because I'm a worshiper. And nothing is going to compromise my walk with God. And I refuse to live an idolatrous life. There is another one. Um, I'm about to find something to say. Um, ministry idolatry. Because some people's idol ain't Buddha or Islam some people's idol is this and a lot of you are in the room you see this as status and you see this as acceptance and you see this as approval but the problem is is you have an esteem issue and you think that you'll feel better about your life if you get the chance to say something here confrontation is never comfortable because um, sometimes you're the last person to know you've been worshiping something whether it's your children your dreams and um, as and when the Lord shows it to you and corrects you on it it may get uncomfortable and he may require of you something radical to do to make sure that there is nothing else before him and he'll give you the principle of firstness, if that makes any sense to you.